recorded, so. Yes, and it's being recorded. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody. I guess I gave a little bit of a background about who I am and the program I'm working with, but thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, yeah, so this is our second to last of our virtual lectures about gardening with nature. Um, and in our last session, we heard a presentation on pollinator gardening um, in containers. And if you weren't able to attend our previous lectures um, and you wanna watch a recording of them, I will be putting the link to our YouTube channel in the chat right now. Um, here it is. And yeah, so um, before we get started, with our presentation, uh, I wanted to let you all know, as I said before, this meeting is being recorded. Um, while our speaker is presenting, please remember to mute your microphone. Um, and we'll have a question and answer session after our speaker presents. So please save your questions for then, or you can put them in the chat. Um, yeah, so tonight we'll be learning about urban beekeeping from Baltimore City Master Gardener, Julie Sullivan. Um, She's amazing and will be introducing herself more. But yeah, thank you so much for being here, Julie, and feel free to take it away. Okay, well, thanks so much, Morgan. Um, so can everyone see that? Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so my lecture tonight is about urban beekeeping and it's really more of just a discussion. Um, and the first thing I wanted to say is, did you know that bees pollinate approximately 130 agricultural crops? Uh-oh, how do I go back, Morgan? Do you know? Eh, sorry guys, hold on. Um, is there like the arrow that you press to, um, it should oh, be the same as it is yes. on your screen. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, so why do we need pollinators? Well, we need pollinators to pollinate our crops. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this because I'm a backyard gardener now, but um, when I first started beekeeping, we had a much larger truck garden that my dad planted every year. And we had some extra land and I had decided I was gonna plant some fruit trees. So we had about 24 fruit trees that were babies. And that's when I decided to get the bees because I was reading about pollinating fruit. Um, but since then, that was a while ago, I'm just a backyard gardener now, and I've been noticing that my plants don't always get pollinated. So I thought it would be good for us to go over this a little bit. So if you look at the picture here, you can see this squash embryo. This is the female squash, right? And I didn't really realize that this is just the embryo, and it still needs to be pollinated in order to turn into a fruit. So over here, this is the male flower, and you can see there's no like bulb on the bottom of the flower. So this is not an embryo, and you're not going to get fruit out of this. So obviously the bees, whichever species of bee it is, has to come in here and collect some of this male pollen and then fly over to the female flower to pollinate it. And then I have a picture here of pollinated squash. And you can see they're starting to get a little larger. The flower on the end is, is dropping off. And then if it doesn't get pollinated or it doesn't get enough pollen, it will not develop and it'll start to turn yellow and go bad. And this is what was happening in my garden, in my backyard. And I was like, hmm, you know, I don't think I have enough pollinators. So the other reason that we want to keep bees, besides the fact that we just want our crops and our vegetables to be pollinated and produced, is that the honeybee population has dropped since 1990 um, by more than half. And most of this loss is due to um, something called colony collapse disorder. And for a long time, it was a big mystery why the bee colonies were just collapsing and dying off. And the Department of Agriculture has done a lot of research and so has a lot of other people. Um, and now it still continues that every year beekeepers, whether they're just residential beekeepers or commercial ones, lose some of their hives. 
And in addition to that, we're also losing native bee species. So this is a good reason why we're encouraging people to become beekeepers. So my background is, like I said, I started my hive. There's a picture of my hive. My sister actually was helping me with it. Um, and so we were on not, we were not urban beekeepers, um, but we'll be hearing from some urban beekeepers later. Um, we were keeping in Howard County, sort of out in a country area. And we were very close to the forest in a watershed area. So our honey actually has a lot of tulip poplar and black locust tree um, nectar, as well as white clover. And we did win a blue ribbon for our honey at the Howard County Fair one year. So that was very exciting. Um, in, in addition to the honey, I also harvested, of course, the beeswax and I made soaps out of that. So it was really fun to get the honey and also the other products that can come out of the beehive. Um, you know, and that was just kind of a side benefit of just having bees there near the garden so they could pollinate it. So in order to get started with beekeeping, it's really easy. You just need to order yourself the starter kit. And I put um, a link here to an Amish com company in Pennsylvania that, that can send you a starter kit. So, but it's easy to buy them online. You can search on amazon.com and there's many companies that offer starter kits. And I'm gonna go over what the equipment is that you need to get started with beekeeping. First of all, uh, a bee doesn't really want to sting you, but they will sometimes try to sting you. So it's important to wear protective equipment. And I found like beekeeping is a very zen activity where you want to move slowly. You don't want to startle the bees. And so as long as you're kind of in that beekeeping zone where you're, you're tending your hive, um, they're not going to try to sting you. Once he stings you, he's going to die. So he really doesn't want to sting you, right? So inside your kit, you're going to have your gloves for protecting your hands and your arms. And you need to have a jacket or a Tyvek suit, which you can buy like as painter's equipment. And then of course the veil protects your face. And then this is the smoker, which you use to calm the bees or distract the bees when you want to open the hive. And then you'll need a hive tool just to open the hive and get the different parts out. So that's part of the, the starter kit. And every hive is just made up of boxes. <laughs> Hold on a second. So there's several wooden boxes stacked on top of each other. And the two most important parts are the hive body, and that's where the bees will build their honeycomb for the queen to lay her eggs. Once the eggs are laid, the worker bees cap them off, and then they're referred to as brood. And the larvae that are in there are in all stages of development. The worker bees also store honey and pollen near the brood to feed the new hatching bees. Also, you need to know that the bees will make what's called propolis to glue the parts together. And this is why when you open the hive to inspect it, you'll need a hive tool to pry them open. So you have a cover that goes over the top to keep it dry. And then you also have an inner cover a queen excluder, which keeps the queen out of the honey collection boxes, a bottom board, and an entrance reducer. So the bottom board is the wooden stand that the hive rests on. And some people also create another stand for the hive to rest on. Um, Morgan says, Morgan, someone's texting me saying they're having trouble getting in. Should I? No, oh, what's their name? Uh, 
I just sent out another email with the link, um, but okay. sorry about that, everybody. I think it's our guest. That's why. Oh, you said their name was Nora? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll look for their email. Sorry. Thank you. Um, okay. So um, where was I? The queen excluder, I was saying, that's important because we're going to put that on top of the brood nest and separate the brood nest from the honey supers. So that way the queen doesn't get up into your honeycomb and lay eggs up there. <laughs> so it's, a, it's important if you want to harvest your honey. So inside each of the boxes, you're going to have frames, which is the wooden part that goes around the outside. And then you'll also have inside the frame foundation. And the foundation that's in this picture is black food grade plastic, and it's coated with just a little bit of beeswax. And that encourages the bees to go ahead and just start building their wax honeycomb structures right there on the foundation. So there's different sizes and, and you'll learn more about that. But like I said, to get started, you purchase your starter kit. Um, and then most hives do have two deep supers and we can ask our guests to talk more about the structure of their hive setup. But uh, my sister and I found that the bees did fill up two deep supers full of brood and honey and pollen. So then you have your two deep supers and then on top of that you have your honey supers. And for just um, our purposes, we're not commercial beekeepers so we want to use the smaller super for the honey that's not going to be so heavy when it's full because we want to be able to manipulate it and move it around. So once you get your hive uh, starter kit and you get your hive set up, how are you going to get your bees? Well, you need to order either a nuke, which is the colony. It's just a small colony of bees living on four to five frames. And, and if you order a nuke, then it's going to be in the process of of creating worker bees already. And it comes with a laying queen, or you can order a package, which is just a box that has two to three pounds of bees inside it. And then you dump the bees inside your new hive. And um, it's good to have an experienced beekeeper help you with the installation once you get your bees. So you can, you can get them in there properly and get it set up. And as soon as they're in there, as long as their queen is in there and healthy, they're going to start taking care of her by building cells for her to lay her eggs. In this picture, you can see a nice uh, layout of different types of cells that the bees are going to create on the foundation. So worker bees are the the major part of your hive. They're the ones that are always working, going out and collecting nectar. Hmm. She still says she can't get in. Um. Um, I sent her, oh, we actually know she's in the waiting room right now. Okay. Um, yeah, I just admitted her, so I think she should be. Good. All right, so in the center of this picture, you can see the worker bees are all working. This is brood, capped brood, and most of these are going to hatch out to be more worker bees because the queen lays about 2,000 eggs a day, and in the height of summer, your hive might have as many as 50,000 bees, and they're going to be very busy, and they, so the queen has to constantly be replacing her workers. Then on the edge of the, this um, particular frame, you can see some larger cells. And these are the drones or the male bees. And a hive doesn't really need that many drones because they don't do much of the work of the hive. But, but it's important to always have some drones in your hive too. So they're usually around the edge. And if you actually pull out one of the frames to inspect it, you'll not only see the brood, but you'll also see there's some pollen and some capped honey cells because they want to keep the, uh, they want to keep the food that they're going to feed to the bees close by. 
So this is what um, an actual small super looks like when the honey is capped. So you can see there's no brood inside this frame. It's all capped honey and it's ready to be harvested. Yum, looks good. <laughs> So here's the regulations in Baltimore City. The prospective beekeepers in Baltimore City have to register and apply for a permit with the city with the animal control, which is in the health department. They also have to register with the Maryland Department of Agriculture. So hives can be kept in any zone throughout the city, but you have to follow the rules and conform to space restrictions. And that's no more than two colonies and one nucleus colony on lots of up to 2,500 square feet. The hives need to be kept either against a solid five foot wall or five feet away from any lot line. And they should not be accessible to the general public. So this means you can keep hives on roofs, on balconies. Um, and one of the key things that the city wants you to make sure you're doing is not having a honeybee, honeybees flying out and into someone's property where say a sidewalk is. They don't want bees just flying where someone can get in the way of them. So it's good to put your hive up on some blocks or or something like that so you can make sure that they're flying up and over your neighbor's property and not right into somebody's porch or balcony or something like that. And those are the rules for Baltimore City. And wait a minute, this is Nora. She's gonna talk in a minute. But I just thought I'd put a slide in here too because maybe not everyone listening to this wants to become a beekeeper, but there's still a lot of things that you can do to help out the bees. One is to plant pollinator plants and native species in your yard to help promote not only honeybees need nectar, but native bee species also. So salvia, clover, and redbud are all good plants for that. And now, Nora, did you get in? Hey, yeah, I got in. It just, um, it was the, the Eventbrite link was not working, but okay. I got the email well, from Morgan. Got <laughs> yeah, the, that email from Morgan helped out. Good, good. Okay. Um, so, hey guys, thank you for having us. So, yeah, I, um, me, myself, and my husband Eric have been um, have been beekeeping in Baltimore City for about five years now. Um, and we started off with a hive on our roof, which you can see this picture right here. We live in West Baltimore in Sandtown. Um, and then, actually, the picture on the left is us feel super satisfied with ourselves after um, catching a swarm in McCullough Homes. So that was an adventure. Um, but yeah, we've been, so we started out with the roof hive and then we expanded to, now we have four hives on our adopt-a-lots, which are like, so the adopt-a-lot program is, is a program through the city where residents can be the caretaker of lots that are owned by the city that, um, and these, this is how many consecutive lots is this space that we have? It's like uh, 18 small lots. It's like 18 small lots that we have this this area um, that's just uh, like half a block from our community garden that we run. Um, so we, when we first were putting a hive there, we actually, we asked the city about it and um, they had never encountered that question before. So they sent us to like zoning and we had this meeting with, what was that meeting with like zoning and housing? And they were like, um sure so, like so while baltimore city um it's great that uh, we have a policy on the books and it's actually uh, pretty permissible in terms of urban ag agriculture and beekeeping um unfortunately it's not um that often utilized or taken advantage of so when we went downtown and tried to process what um should have been a simple application um, we just were met with a bunch of puzzled faces, but we were able to navigate the process. Um, and, you know, it's been a great complement to the other activities um, that Nora has going on at the community garden. 
Yeah, so trying to get more neighbors involved. We've had like um, folks donate more hive boxes to us. So I've been able to get one of our garden mates, Savannah, um, a hive of her own. And then, you know, through doing a, like a bunch of splits and things and, you know, multiplying our hives, it, and once you have the gear, now it's like a relatively free operation. Um, when in the beginning to start off a hive can be like, can be a kind of a big expense for someone, um, you know, to buy a package of bees is we'll run you around a couple hundred mm -hmm. and then like the hive supplies and everything. So we want to make it like a accessible thing for the community and um, involve more beekeepers in the area and teach more beekeepers. We were really surprised uh, by how well, well, pleasantly surprised, I should say, uh, by how well received uh, the bee, uh, the hives and the beekeeping uh, were by the community. At first, we weren't sure if folks were going to be scared of the bees, which, you know, is a natural reaction to um, from people who don't know better. Um, but and most people do keep their uh, distance, but there's a pleasant curiosity. Everyone uh, wonders, um, you know, what's going on. And um, we have had some success in terms of harvesting honey and been able to share that with the neighbors and stuff like that. So it's been a, a great experience, I think, uh, for us and for everyone. Yeah, mostly folks just have a lot of curiosity about it. Um, like when we uh, caught the swarm over in McCullough Homes, um, we actually, we, we have a friend who listens to the like police scanner and she overheard them say like there was a, sw like a swarm on a tree in McCullough Homes. So we were like, okay, we're going. And we went and we went with like, you know, a bucket and a broom and we're right in the middle, middle of McCullough Homes, you know, people passing by. And like the one, the first thing someone said to us was like, you're not going to hurt them. Right. Like I've been watching those bees in that tree for years. Like, and Someone had a story of like when honeycomb fell out of one of the trees one time because mm -hmm. um, there was like a tree in the middle of the housing projects that was like, I guess, somewhat hollowed out in the middle. And they were the bees were were coming in and out from a really high point up there. Um, so. so a couple of things um, that are interesting about that story. Um, one is like Nora said, how, you know, folks were um, didn't want the bees to be harmed. Um, but second is they didn't know who to call. They called the police um, just because they didn't know who else to call. Um, and the police weren't going to respond. Um, it was only a matter of, um, you know, happenstance that we happened to get the information. Um, but um, there's, of course, um, a, a hotline um, that you can call um, and an email address um, that you can do the state um, for beekeepers who are registered to collect swarms. Um, and so when we registered our beehives on the state side, um, there's an option to sign up to be on that list. And we never quite had the courage to do that. Um, but since the um, experience, um, catching that swarm and a couple others, we are now on that list. Um, so as long as folks have the education, um, you know, if you have a swarm, you can uh, contact a local beekeeper uh, like us or someone in your area to deal with that problem. Um, okay, do you guys want to say anything else? I'm going to call on another beekeeper that's uh, in Baltimore City, and then at the end, we're going to have question and answer, and I'm sure that you guys can probably answer a lot of the questions. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's about it. Like, we've been also surprised at how, like, we haven't really had to do much um, feeding of our bees. Like, you feed them, you know, sugar water to bolster them up, like, in their, their beginning phases. But um, we haven't really been doing that much because, like, city bees really find, like, a lot of diverse pollen. Um, and there's a surprising amount of, of trees in this area that they get pollen from in the spring. Um, and then we like, you know, bolster things up in the community garden with a lot of flowers and we add like rows of annuals in the, in the lots where, where the bees are. Um, so that's been awesome. And the honey tastes great. It's like our pollen is like when you look at the, the bee bread, when you're pulling it out of the hive is like rainbow colors. Like it's just, it's, it's so diverse. So wow. well, I think city beekeeping is, is pretty awesome. And I noticed that you're not using a typical foundation structure or 
Do you want to talk a little bit about? Oh, yeah. So this is high? our on on the right. That's our, our top bar hive, um, which uh, that's actually where we put one of our the swarm from McCullough homes. And they did really, really well in there. So this is like a hive that's a little bit more of like a natural beekeeping method where um, they build the comb on these strips of wood. Um, and there's no like barriers between the between the comb, which um, uh, natural beekeepers say is like better for bee communication um, because they communicate through like vibrations and to put like a board in between them is like not exactly very bee centered. Like the, the traditional hives on the left are more created that way for honey production. And the, the hive structure on the right is more created similarly to how bees would build a hive in nature. So that's like what they would, how they would build it in the hollow of a tree. Um, mm -hmm. And the issue though with the top bar hive is the fact that harvesting honey is a little bit more difficult. You have to, if you wanted to harvest honey, you'd have to like take a whole, um, a whole sheet of it and do the crush and strain method. So you'd have, you'd have to like basically crush all that comb and squeeze out the honey. Um, but the hive on the left, you could just take the cap off, put it in the centrifuge spinner and take the honey out. And then you could give the comb back for the bees to reuse. So, right. yeah, it just also the hive on the right just takes a lot more management. You have why, to be in why take more management? What do you have to do? So the they sometimes will naturally form the comb like waving off to the side. So you have to kind of like re-straighten it. Otherwise, you'll get to the point where you can't even open it anymore because the comb will be built on different angles. And by taking out one of those bars, it could cause the comb to break and fall. Oh. Mm -hmm. Another question I had, I know you said you had a source for um, bee, getting bees. And I wondered what, what season, what time of year do you put the package or nuke in the hive to start a new hive? Sure. We usually do it in definitely in the spring, in March. I would say um, late March. You know, s similar to planting flowers, like the earlier the better, but not too early. Yeah. Um. So, um, I think usually, um, and it can be a little bit competitive depending on where you're getting your bees from. You have to get your orders in early sometimes. So if you don't, you know, get your order in early enough, you might, you know, have to wait for a later delivery. Um, but, you know, ideally, um, like late, late April, March. early May. No, not that. It's usually more like late March. I, I know we've and gotten to late March. You have to give them some sugar water because not everything's going to be blooming yet, but earlier is better, I think, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. So they can get established. Also, the thing about that is it's better to order from a local person, like, a, like we order from this guy, Josh, who goes down to Georgia and picks up all the um, cases of bees himself and drives them here as opposed to ordering from a place like Kelly Bees or Man Lake where those are getting shipped by like general mail like those are getting shipped through like UPS and stuff and they could be in the carrier vehicles for longer with not the proper ventilation so when we bordered from those big places like Kelly Bees you sometimes have a couple inches of dead bees in the bottom of the uh, of the package, but yes. when we order from Josh, there's hardly any because he's like, he goes down there with a van and he's taking care of them and he's airing out the van and he's making sure he's back in a timely matter. So that's why it's way better to get from someone locally, okay. even though they're getting them from down South anyway, but you know, having someone that knows about bees transporting. Do you know what, what, uh, strain of bee you have? I know there's different honeybees and some of them are known to be less aggressive than others and more friendly. So our bees, the first ones we got were Italian bees, which we found were more docile, but they were not as strong through the winter. Um, so then we had tried actually a Russian hive, which are known to be a little more aggressive. Um, they're a little darker in coloration um, and they are, they're, they produce, I think they, I think they maybe produced about the same as the as the Italian bees, but they were a little bit more fierce. Um, but the ones that we started getting from Josh are kind of like a, kind of a mix. He's just got, I mean, he's been breeding them down there for a really long time. And he, 
wasn't able to tell us like what specific breed they were. So sort okay. of a hybrid. And then also the wild bees that we've caught, or, you know, not sure, not always sure. But the ones we've caught in Baltimore actually did better with mites and things because they seem to be like more resistant than mm. some of the bees that we had gotten in the past. So that's why it's awesome to find a swarm locally because those bees have existed without mite treatment here in Baltimore. So that means that they have some, some sort of immunity. And so do you have the um, insert in your bottom yeah. board to see if your bees have mites? We do, we have done, we have checked that before and we, we have had some mites, like we lost a couple hives maybe three years ago to mites or we thought it was mites. It's hard to um, ever know for sure. Yeah, but they, you know, it's, if they don't get their population, the mites kind of hinder their population right before they go into winter and then they have too small of a cluster to overwinter. Um, so I think we've lost a couple to, high, to, to mites, unless there was another factor. It's really hard to tell. Um, but since we've been splitting more of our hives that have survived, they've done better because okay. they've like been, had more resistance, I guess. And you do use two deep, deep supers I'm seeing on the picture on the left. And then how many honey supers do you usually put on the top? We've put, we've only put as much as like two supers on top, right? I think maybe one time we did three, but yeah, we always give them the two deeps for them for, you know, for their honey. And then we add on the supers as they fill up. Ooh, cool. And so you're not selling your honey or anything. You're just giving it away right we, now. Yeah, we had been giving it away. We had sold a little bit when we had a really big harvest. I usually, that was last, that was last summer. The one time that we had a big harvest. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, um, you know, out of five seasons, I guess, um, um, last year is the only year that we had a... Um, like a really big like harvest. Like a significant harvest. And we were hoping to repeat that this year, but unfortunately we didn't have as much luck. So uh, learning as we go, but it's a, a bit of a uh, lottery. Okay. Cool, cool. All right, I'm gonna call on um, Nicole, but we're gonna ask you guys some questions soon. So That's stay great. tuned. Thank you. Um, hmm. Now, Nicole, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Nice to meet everybody and exciting to meet some other uh, fellow beekeepers in the city. Um, so I keep bees on, technically it's Under Armour's property. Um, I had worked there and two years ago, a little over two years ago, um, I was working on a design for a friend's um, logo and it was like a child uh friend like child friendly child company um so i went to the library and i got some books um with children's illustrations and one of the books that i took out was all about bees all types of bees native bees how to be a steward for bees how to build bee habitats pollinator gardening then a whole nine yards and it did go into um beekeeping and i was like this is pretty awesome um I wonder if I could do this. So then I got on Google and I was searching beekeeping classes and I found a multitude around the city. There's one um, a little north of the city. Um, basically every county has a beekeeping association and what was uh, conducive to my schedule was a beekeeping association in Howard County. So I was telling my husband about it and I was like, do you want to do this? And he was like, well, how much does it cost? So I was like, it's like $50 to take a class. And it was once a week for about six weeks. He's like, sign me up. So we signed up for the Howard County Beekeeping Association, Beekeeping 101. And six weeks later, we were like, okay, I guess we're buying some bees. And this was right before COVID. Um, so throughout the end of January, February, uh, we took this beekeeping class and we We've, I'm not an, like, I'm not like not a nature girl, but I'm like an artistic person. So like, I enjoy spending time inside and drawing and like doing, you know, hobby things inside, but, like not a bug person, not pumped about getting dirty and all that stuff. So don't know what really inspired me to just like go for this, but, um, we ended up with buying two, two packages. So that's about 3000 bees in, 
um, you know, this mesh box, um, like everybody kind of talked about, and we bought two sets of hives. So our, the team kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier. It's about 800 to about $1,200, depending on what equipment you buy, um, what type of, you know, how much gear, what type of suit you want. I went for um, the pants, the full jacket, the veil that's attached, very well ventilated. I bought it from a connection that a friend of a friend of a friend uh, had in Virginia. So we bought all our equipment through him. Um, he had a contact for bees, so things were pretty organic and local. There are many places that you can go and buy, and we chose the traditional Langstroth style live. So this is the stack boxes. Um, there's two chambers that the bees lay in, and then you can add as many honey supers um, on top where ideally the bees, you know, uh, make the honey. Um, your first year of beekeeping, it's somewhat expected to not expect any honey. What the bees do, you get that package, you install them in the box, and they produce. What they're focused on is um, creating wax on that black foundation, laying as many eggs as possible, creating the largest number of bees that they can get to before the end of the season, um, which is around, I would say, October. Um, you can obviously still go into your bees as late as November on a really warm day, about 50 degrees. Um, so they're focused on creating honey, creating baby bees, getting out through the system, increasing their numbers so that come winter time, like now, they can hustle together in a ball um, and they don't hibernate, they stay in that hive, they're alive, they're awake, um, and they cluster to get through winter and they create a heat source. So we were incredibly lucky. We had a very productive hive um, and we had a small honey harvest our first year. Throughout our first year, um, we did treat for mites. Um, there's many different mite treatments that you can invest in as a beekeeper. Um, one of my favorite lines that we heard throughout class and I've experienced it is beekeeping is an art, it's not a science. So there are things that you know you learn as a beekeeper, like there's larva, there's brood, there's hatching, there's a worker bee, there's a mortuary bee, there's a nurse bee, there's all these different things. There's knowledge that you can bring in as a beekeeper. Um, but all of that, how you manage your hive is your own art. It's your own style. You're going to learn things that work for one hive, three feet away at your next hive, it might not work out quite as well. Um, and you have to know what signs to look for as a beekeeper to continue to manage that hive really well. So, um, the first year, this area that Under Armour, um, owned, I pitched to them. I was like, Hey, I'm getting these bees. Like, what do you think about hosting them on your property? You have this garden. Um, you're not really utilizing it. There's a couple active plots. Like, what do you think? And they're like, sure. Like, let's do it. And somehow I convinced them to let me host there while I was still employed with them. COVID happened. Everything shut down. The garden pretty much, um, was laid bare. Um, we managed these two hives all throughout our first year. We had a small honey harvest, um, and we learned a lot. Like every time we would go in the hive, we would inspect every single frame. We'd be inspecting probably at least an hour for two hives, which is kind of aggressive looking back on it. You really shouldn't need to be in a hive for that long. Um, but it was a learning experience for us. We did really well. Both hives survived through the winter. Um, the second year in the garden, so this is year number two for us, um, a new person came and kind of established the garden to be a little bit more organized and um, immersed in the community. So the garden officially has a name now. It's the Locust Point Community Garden. We are located right in Locust Point on Halbert and Hall Street, like literally like amid the community, which is awesome. Um, I've only had one person who outwardly was like, Hey, I'm really allergic to bees. Like how long are they here for? I'm not okay with this. Um, best practice as an urban beekeeper is like checking in with your people around you. Um, common things in my beekeeping class, they were like, don't ask for permission because people are going to tell you, no, like, I don't want your bees here being not as necessarily informed of what honeybees are. This person that approached me said I was stung. I stepped on a hive. And all these bees came and stung me and I went into anaphylactic shock. Something you learn when you do your research is all different bees have different types of venom. So if you're allergic to a ground bee reaction, which 
bees live in the ground and that's probably likely maybe what she stepped on. If there were that many, you're going to have a different reaction, if anything, to a honeybee. So being a beekeeper is, um, an amazing experience and part of your responsibility and being a steward and teaching other people about bees is like being able to have those conversations and knowing how to manage those difficult moments of like, I don't like bees, like get them out of here. Or like, there's a swarm up there and I want to spray it. Like uh, Nora and Eric said, like, well, there's an education piece to that. Like, well, we shouldn't spray these bees because, you know, they're pollinating, they're producing, you know, a fifth of a teaspoon of, you know, honey a year. And that's really valuable. And this is why, like, you know, we want to try to preserve these bees. Um, so huge learning experience. This year, our bees are doing awesome. Um, we split twice, which basically means your hive is growing. Um, and bees swarm. When bees swarm, that means they're leaving. And as a community uh, urban beekeeper, I want to make sure that those bees aren't landing on someone's roof or in their siding. And you've probably all seen the Texas bee woman um, without any gear pulling, you know, colonies out of sheds or out of umbrellas or, you know, all of her crazy stories. Um, that's great that she has those opportunities as a beekeeper in an urban environment. You want to mitigate that because you don't want to make anybody unhappy. Um, so managing your bees, knowing when to split and why, because there's growth, because maybe you saw a lot of queen cells. That's something that you're looking for as you're managing, being able to split and multiply your hives. Some people love that. Some people get a little nervous about that. Um, we split, we lost the hive. We tried to get them queen rate and make sure she was producing. Didn't work out. Our third hive, um, we, like I mentioned earlier, treat for mites um, throughout the year. Um, some people choose not to treat for mites and that's a whole different journey and, you know, that's okay. People manage it differently. A mite is basically, I like to explain it as like a flea or like kind of like a flea, like, but on bees, they're tiny little microscopic bugs. You can see them if you look in the right place. They feed on the armpits of bees and that's their fat cell. It's bad because they weaken the bees immunity. And once all of your colonies of bees are weakened, then that's how your hive numbers start to go down. When you're losing numbers of bees, then that means they're uh, more susceptible to pests. Like our hive right now, we're pretty sure we have wax moths. They're these nasty um, bugs that come in, they eat the wax, they eat the pollen, and the bees don't have enough in their colony to fight them off. So we have lower numbers. When you have lower numbers, your huddle for the winter gets smaller, their chances of survival, go down. So it's pretty typical to expect uh, potentially 40 to 50% of hive loss um, year to year as a beekeeper, whether you're new, whether you're experienced, it's something that comes with the job. Um, mites were discovered in the 70s in the States. Um, so it wasn't something that was this like long time predator in bees. It's somewhat of a recent development pest that beekeepers kind of had to start defending against and treating for. And the natural movement versus the chemical movement, kind of something like normal, like holistic medicine, everybody has a different way to, to manage it. We chose to do chemical because that's what we're comfortable right now. And being in year two, we definitely want to keep exploring, but we're on Google a lot and we feel comfortable with the knowledge we've learned in our class and um, by what we find on, on the internet. Um, so we have three hives now. We found a swarm at Sagamore Rye Whiskey, which was pretty crazy. Um, we were going over there after being here at our hives um, just to have a cocktail. Walking through the parking lot, we found a swarm. So we went over to the bar, asked for a box. Be the bartenders were kind of just like, all right, this is, this is great, I guess. Like, I don't really know what you're doing, but here you go. And then we scooped them up and then we're able to add to our hives, which was really cool. Um, so you get a little bit of that joy and that excitement as a beekeeper when you start to notice bees in the environment and start to understand this is the benefit they're providing. And then once people you know, know that you're the bee person, then they get excited about it. So it's a really cool thing um, to start watching kind of uh, evolve. This year, <clears throat> we had two um, honey harvests, which was great. Um, and I was able to create a website. Um, <coughs> sorry, just all the talking it drives me out. Um, and we were able to sell out, I think we had 40 pounds the first time, which is one jar of honey pictured here. And then the second time we had 80, 
which is a lot. So beekeeping is awesome. It's a huge investment in time, um, doing your research, you know, having a partner is always a great thing because those boxes are heavy, um, and lifting them up and maneuvering with them. Lifting something heavy is hard. Lifting a heavy thing coated in bees is like a whole other endeavor. So, um, having a partner to go in with you is always a great thing. Um, and then if you do get to harvest honey, um, being prepared in that time and energy and potential equipment is another big thing this year. There was a lot of glass sort shortages. So finding the jars was a little bit of an endeavor. Um, and then just setting aside time to spend all day and strip your hives and knowing what to take and, um, how much honey to leave behind so that the bees can get through winter is, is a huge thing. But if you're interested in, um, beekeeping in the city, um, Morgan had shared a bunch of links with you guys, basically like your, you apply for your certificate, you get a nice, um, little thing in the mail saying like you're an official beekeeper acknowledged by the agricultural, um, state of Maryland. Bees are recognized as livestock. Um, so that's like a cool thing that you get to own and then being really cognizant of your neighbors. This lot is probably four to six houses wide, two houses deep. So understanding the space, making sure everybody's like cool with you being there and that you're having those um, appropriate conversations. And then as a beginner, you know, read, 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 find a mentor and or take a class. That's the best advice I can get. Yeah, the <laughs> Howard County Beekeeping Association, I probably also took that class. Mm -hmm. um, and they also had the um, honey extractor equipment. So we were able to just bring our, our um, you know, our honey supers over there and use their large extractor yeah. to get our honey, which was nice. Um, I didn't find it was a huge um, investment in money. I think the starter hive that I showed you, you're going to spend around $200 for the starter kit. And, and then of course you have to get the bees, but um, you may also be adding additional boxes as you go along. Yeah, we gang bustered on that one because my husband was all into it. He's like, let's get as many hives as we can. Yeah. Let's make sure we have enough boxes. We had to prime everything, paint it. Um, uh -huh. you know, and it's fine if you build, so you can, you can get the hives all fully assembled, but you can also build your own and paint yep. them. And I really like that process, yeah, like early in March, you know, to, to be building my hive as winter's ending and, and yeah. to be thinking about the spring that's coming. So that's, that's a, another fun piece of it. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? What else should we talk about? Uh, Nora and Eric, do you have anything else to add? I don't know if you guys have any experience with maybe the flow hive. I think people could maybe have questions about that since I feel like it's a popular topic. Yeah, I've, I've seen that hive. I've never, we've never used that, that hive before. It seems pretty cool, um, but yeah, that's like where you can like extract the honey right from the hive. Mm -hmm. I don't really understand how it works, but um, yeah. <laughs> they, um, the thing with the flow hive is it's attractive. It was designed and developed in Australia. And a lot of people think, oh, it's really easy for beekeeping. I just go outside and I crank it and I have honey. Um, you still have to manage your bees. You still have to have these brood chambers below it. Um, and that where the, the honey's being stored is just a plastic frame. So it's an artificial um, place that just gets cracked open and then put back together. So it's not actually okay. wax. Yeah. Right. And like, yeah, what you said with, you know, you still have to do all the management, which you were, mm -hmm. you were saying before, like, that's a big part of it, having the time to dedicate to it. Like for us, um, a, the years that we haven't really harvested much honey, most of the reason is because we didn't have like the time to heavily manage it to like, mm -hmm. you know, really be checking in on them enough. Um, you know, cause when you have, four or five hives um to Power. go in and check them all could you could you know spend like five hours doing that if you if you yeah. really wanted to be thorough yeah. um and then like the harvest takes time and um you know what when you have to do like switcheroos and you know take mm -hmm. some nurse bees from one hive or take some resources from one hive to another hive 
you kind of got to really plot things out and think about it. So like this 100%. year, we didn't really just, we just didn't have the time to check enough and to manage enough. And yeah. that's, that's why we didn't. And I'm sure time. like, it's like my joke with my husband. It's like a great, like first year, second year, whatever year of marriage you're on, like that communication test of like, what are we doing? Right. What are we seeing? Like, how do we fix right. this? And like, you have yeah. to make those decisions while you're in there. Yep. And it's, it's really fun. It can be exciting, can be nerve wracking. Um, and a lot of times you're just like, crap, like we don't know what to do or what's going on. Um, and we took a class here in Baltimore City through Charm City um, Farms, which I don't think exists anymore. It's like near, um, I heard they closed down or something, but um, we loved that course and we love that we have our beekeeper instructor. We used to hit him up all the time and send him pictures of like issues we were having and Huge. Was, was super thankful for that because the internet will just confuse you even more. Agreed. Uh -huh. yeah. Anthony has a question. Yeah. Um, he says, having bees in the city, do you make an attempt to educate neighbors about pesticides and their effect on your honey bees and the bees yeah, it's in not general? The city. It's, it's not the neighbors, it's the city. Yeah. So that's what my husband just reminded us. <laughs> It's not the neighbors spraying the pesticides. It's the city of Baltimore. Right. They're the ones spraying. They're the ones putting the little flags up in everybody's little backyards. And they don't tell you when they're doing it. And, um, and yeah, so, like, our neighbors don't really use pesticides. Like, they, like I don't know. General people in the city are not, like, spraying for bugs or anything. or And they're not, like, spraying, you know, most of them aren't farming and spraying their crops which i know that's a big issue in more rural areas so like if you're if you're a beekeeper i've heard i know a lot of my friends in pennsylvania who have be, been beekeeping have major issues with the the big fact big farms near them and the fact that they're spraying there and it's killing their hives but here we don't have that issue but yeah you got baltimore city doing what they want yeah. And you'll find too, that like neighbors will engage with you and they'll see you when they walk by and they're like, Oh, what are you doing? Oh my gosh. Like, I didn't know you were here. Um, the Locust Point Community Gardens, a great resource for us. They'll communicate like, Hey, the beekeepers are doing this. Like, please don't spray. Hey, like don't mow right next to the hive. Like you might, you might get stung because the vibrations upset the hive. So we try to have that two way conversation. And I try to use my website a little bit to help educate people if they are buying honey for me. I was like, yeah, like be a bee steward. Don't use as many chemicals. Like it's good for them. It's good for you. <laughs> so you have a separate website um, that's not the gardens website? Correct. Yeah. It's um, marylandhoneyshop.com. Um, and I just started it just to put the honey up because everybody was asking, how can I buy some? And I wanted to be able to share it, but it was hard to manage inventory <laughs> and like who, who was first in the, in the list. So, um, yeah, that was, um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Maryland honey shop. That was, that was it. And then I post on my Instagram, like, it's not all about bees. It's me personal, but I, I post bee things because everybody's asking like, how are they? And then you're that person at the party that's like talking about bees and people are like, wait, what happens? And then it's a journey. <laughs> Okay, does anyone else have any other questions or comments? I have a few resources here that I'll post in the chat as well. Julie, can I uh, just ask a, a question yes. to the beekeepers in Baltimore? Sure. How, yes. how many, how many uh, registered uh, beekeepers are there in, in the city? I, I'm asking, oh, I'm, I'm from sure. New York State and Oh. I'm dealing with a, a city upstate that mm. wants to establish uh, regulations for That's beekeeping. It. And uh, so I'm, I'm curious as to, uh, you know, how many uh, are registered. And I, from what I gather, uh, they register with the uh, state, uh, their hives, mm -hmm. but then the city, does the city do any other registration? Yeah, you register, um, I'll have to look what the website is. You, you register through the city um, so that it's like known that you have like wild animals on your property. So you're, you're registering with the city and also with the state. 
the health department. It's the city health department. Health yeah. department, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like That's animal the, control. It's like animal yeah. control. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. how New York City does it. Yeah, I don't know of how many active um, people are in the city. I know there was a Facebook group, the Baltimore um, Beekeeping Network. It was like BBBN. Um, and I forget, there might've been like under a hundred active members, um, the last time I was on the page. Um, one thing too, you can look at is I know certain states give grants for hosting hives and, and being beekeepers. So that could be something to look into. I had a friend in New York and they're like, Hey, just come up here and put hives on our property and then you can get them for free or you can get a grant or some money for it. So it could be interesting to look into. Mm -hmm. Now, does the city encourage you at all to uh, have any kind of insurance, liability insurance? No. Um, no. And that was uh, something that we discussed with Under Armour as well. And they didn't ask us to be under it, um, under their policy in any way, shape or form. You do have to ensure that you your hives can't be easily accessed. So for us, that means having a fence like the property is already enclosed, so uh -huh. we're kind of covered there. Um, we do have signs up saying like, hey, there are bees here. Like, this is kind of all at your own risk. Um, we haven't had anybody get stung, to my knowledge. Um, and under my own personal um, insurance, I think I'm technically covered. I've had the conversation with my insurance agent, but they're just like, yeah, we really don't know. You're probably fine. <laughs> And then when it comes uh, to harvesting and selling honey, there's certain rules you have to stay under um, to ensure that you're kind of like, I don't want to say kosher because that's not the right word, but like that you're doing everything properly um, per the state. It's eight do, do they require any uh, health department inspection or? No. So if you have pure, raw, 100% honey that you're labeling Per yep. Maryland cottage laws, you're good to go. If you try to infuse with heat, vanilla, you know, any kind of herbs or extracts, then it's required to be uh, Maryland state inspected. Health up like Maryland food, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, Nora, I know your hives that are on the um, lot, you, you have a chicken wire fence around those, right? Yeah. Um, actually, not currently. Um, so yeah, we, we had a chicken wire fence, but then we moved them to the side of like one of our, um, shipping containers that we have out there that we, we store like, um, stuff for the garden and like the, the tractor and stuff. Um, so we, we don't currently have a fence around them. You know, it's kind of a, a lawless land out here in West Baltimore. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have a lot of, like, a lot of open space and a lot of, um, like, so, you know, we have that this large air large lot area and then across the alley from that is another large lot area that's owned by the city that we just we plant trees there it's not actually our adopt a lot technically but um we take care we mow the grass there we take care of it um we make the space nice and, and clear it of trash so no one gives us any lip we are you know we're doing doing good by the neighbors and everything, but we should put up a fence. <laughs> well, I mean, like, you're fine as long as it's not, like the thing I think you risk is like, hey, the person going into a beehive is not very smart because, uh, you know, they're definitely gonna stung because when, when that's an invasion, you know, you are right. putting yourself at risk. But like too, if, if people don't notice it, if you're somewhat camouflaged, like it sounds like you are, you're, you're good. Yeah, we kind of have like some natural barriers that we've made, like yeah. planting some shrubs and things. Yeah. So yeah, no one's no one's trying really trying to get close. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's interesting that the two of you have your hives in really different settings. Mm -hmm. Like um, Nicole's is in on the Under Armour's property, which is you know a com commercial setting, and that's a great idea too for finding places to keep your bees. I think in the city mm -hmm. is to find a company that's willing to do that, and then. Um, Nora and Eric, you're really residential in the city, city living. Yeah. And I know I went to your community garden, so I know that it's kind of a hidden little gem and it's not easily seen by people that are just driving by. So, um, yeah, and yeah. the lots are in like the same kind of realm. It's like the, the blocks here are kind of built with like an inner block area that everybody's backyard goes up to. So, 
you really got to go down like the right alley to get there. So I want to ask you guys one last question. Um, would you do it again? I mean, are you happy that you're keeping bees? What's the overall reward? I mean, yeah, we will definitely be keeping at it. Um, you know, there are definitely a lot of losses and, you know, sometimes it can really seem hopeless because um, we have lost a fair amount of hives, but um, there's also been like a, a lot of joy and like, it's been awesome, you know, showing neighbors what we do and, you know, exposing the community to it has been the most rewarding part. So we will keep going with it as long as we have, we have time to, to keep making it happen. And I mean, you know, trying to get more, you know, community members here involved in beekeeping is important to us trying to get, you know, more black folks involved with beekeeping because it has been a predominantly like white, white male mm -hmm. hobby. Yeah. Yeah, I'll echo that. I feel like the connections that I've made, like Facebook in real life, um, even on Instagram, like I've definitely made an effort to at least be able to connect with female beekeepers. And I've made a lot of great diverse beekeeping uh, connections as well, which has been really rewarding. Um, I do feel like I'm able to uh, kind of give back to nature in, in a way. Um, and just even being more aware now, like, um, you know, we have different types of bees where I live currently and it's like, okay, I didn't realize there was a mason bee. I didn't realize there was um, this other type of bee. Um, and I feel, you know, more engaged with being able to um, wanna protect what nature is around me, um, not just like, squish a bug because it's inconvenient and we're out at lunch and this woman was like losing her mind because her husband was smashing a winged insect it was a hornet but she thought it was a honeybee and it was like a cool way to have a conversation with people I didn't know at all I was like oh yeah like actually that's a hornet and they're you know da 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 and they they had grandkids with them and they were all excited about learning about insects so it's a cool thing to be able to connect with other people about and it's time, it's money, it's blood, sweat, tears, but I've been able to introduce a lot of friends to the hive and they're like, oh my God, I had no idea. And I was like, yeah, that's awesome. So if it's something you're interested in, definitely do some research, see if this is something you want to commit to um, and feel free to reach out to any of us. It's definitely an amazing experience. Great, thanks. Thank you guys so much. I mean, I really appreciate you coming on to talk about the urban aspect of this because my hives were not urban. so. I feel like I have learned uh, a lot and, and I just want to thank you for taking your time to talk with us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for inviting us. Share your platform. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, that was an amazing presentation, Julie. And thank you so much, Nora and Nicole. Um, amazing special surprise guest. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Thank you everybody for being here. I'm just gonna post, uh, we have two upcoming uh, workshops slash lectures. Um, next week, we're gonna have a tree pruning workshop in person at mm. uh, Druid Hill Nursery. So a bit of a different topic, but if you're interested, please feel free to stop by. And then we're gonna have one more um, virtual lecture on December 9th about companion planting. So both of those links are in the chat. And um, yeah, thank you all for coming tonight. Have a good one. Hey, Morgan, oh, <laughs> can I just say one, one thing? Uh, I appreciate you let me ask a lot of questions tonight about uh, the regulations. Uh, if you're interested in reading about urban beekeeping in New York City, there's a book written by a beekeeper Mm. named Andrew Cote, C-O-T-E. It's mm. called Honey and Venom. Ooh. And it's uh, very interesting about how the, the city went about, uh, you know, getting their regulations changed to allow uh, beekeeping. And then all of the, you know, things that happened <laughs> in the last 10 years uh, and th that this person was involved in. So uh, I would recommend it. And on the Christmas Great. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. So thanks. Thanks for letting me be on tonight. Yeah. We've been happy to have you.
Yeah, I put a link to the book in the chat too, if anyone's interested. Right. Thank you, I'm gonna check that out. So, All right, thank you, good night everyone. Bye guys, thank you. You guys have a good one.